Welcome to day one. I'm Bill Turpy. Loss is part of living, but that still doesn't make losses easy to live with. How can we face our losses? Stay with us. How can you prepare yourself now for the loss of a loved one later? And what can, what can you do in someone's life now so that when they're gone, it won't be so difficult for you? An interesting question, a question that strikes me as both practical, but in some sense, selfish. What do you hear him asking? Well, how do you hear that as selfish? I don't hear that as I, selfish. I hear him saying, how do I protect myself from the loss of someone close to me? You can't protect yourself, can you? No, what I, what I hear in that is a genuine yearning to live life to the fullest now. How do I live life to the fullest now with the people around me so that I don't have any regrets later on? I think we know that people in our culture are not going to the funerals of their neighbors and friends as much as they used to, only when it's a family member or someone closely connected. And I think to go to the funeral of a neighbor or a friend is not only to grieve for them, but also to walk through the pattern of um, what is it like to approach a loss and what are the promises that we hold on to. When I was in seminary, I had a professor named Howard Hanchi who said this is the fundamental theological question that we in the church are to prepare people for, that more than any other issue, more than any other theological crisis they're going to have. It is how to deal with the loss that is inevitable. And we are in the role of building a foundation for them. But I think part of the issue that we also have to deal with that I think you were addressing at the very beginning is there is a myth out there that the person of faith can avoid loss. And I think that's part of the foundation we lay as well is telling people that loss is not the antithesis of having faith. Loss is part of living. Grieving is part of being alive. But I've actually met people who did just deny death. They, they don't want anything to do with death. They won't go to funerals. They won't acknowledge that somebody has died. I mean, it's just not on their radar screen. Well, this is a personal question for me because of I have family members that are getting older, parents, and to me, I think it's very important that we spend quality time with those that we love. But I also think deeper than this question per se is quality. People are dealing with quality of life now and dying with dignity. And with the way medicine and science is today with so many breakthroughs and people living longer or being able to be on life support and having to make those types of decisions, I think people are struggling with that whole grief issue and saying goodbye and how long do I let mom and dad stay on life support. Um, it brings up so many other issues nowadays than just they've died and let's bury them and move on with our lives. Sandra Wheeler from Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C., raises another question about this issue of loss. Where in our society would we learn the patience it takes to wait for the pain of loss to subside, to wait for the slow work of healing to be done? I think we've become a society in which we're so fast-paced. And you have a lot of people that will have a loved one that dies on Monday and they're expected to be back at work on Wednesday. And so the grieving process is you grieve for the day of the funeral and then that's it. You're expected to get right back into the workforce. But the reality is that grieving comes in many different forms and you can't say, put a timeline on when someone stops grieving and but society tends to put a person in a basket and say, look, you've had your time to grieve. They're dead, they're gone, move on. I mean, I mean in Greek culture, when I first visited Greece, you would see women in those small villages in black. They were mourning for a year, wearing black. No question, in our church, one of the things, and in culture at large, one of the things we run into all the time is somebody loses a spouse, there's a widow, and people say, how's she doing? And the real question is, when someone says, she's doing well, the answer means she's not showing her grief at all. She's bearing up under the load and not letting anyone know that she's grieving. What, what about this passage, blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. The Jewish tradition has such a wonderful uh, week-long 
time of mourning. That is a, it seems to be a response to that, uh, to your question. What, what do you call it? Sitting Shiva, right? Shiva. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah. For seven days, they sit and they mourn and grieve together. And then that full year is a time of expected grieving. And then that one year anniversary, they get together again and, and celebrate. Well, let's, let's take this out of the realm of death and put it in loss of a job. Mm. Lots loss of, of yeah. a, uh, a, you know, a lifestyle. I mean, I, I there, there are voluntary losses as well, I think. And I hope that the church will help families dealing with uh, uh, times when they find out, for instance, brothers or sisters or um, cousins or persons in the, in the life of the family um, come out of the closet and are gay or lesbian. Do we then shun that particular person in our families? And if that's what's happening, are we supporting the kinds of love relationships where we can all be accepted for who we are, what we believe, and, and what we're just accepted exactly as we are? Yeah, can, think, can, yeah. can that happen? And, and can the church help that to happen in more, um, um, sh in surer ways, in more instances than we find mm -hmm. right now? Well, it's also worth saying, what about other kinds of losses? Because I think loss also brings a crisis of identity. Very often, if you lose a job, what we discover is that people have a sense of my value, my worth, my being came from my job. And I think that's an important role of the church as well, that sometimes in that loss we say there is a new sense of identity that we can give you. Between the old sense and the new sense, there's often a period of rage um, at the loss of the old. And one of the things I rejoice about uh, in the church is the sense of lament is now welcome in a way that it has not been before. So patience is not always a quiet patience. It sometimes is an angry patience. For us, what has helped you pass through loss best? It is such a relief to me in, in a time of loss when someone will simply take the time with me. Lots of people say, hey, how are you doing? And I'm guilty of that as well. Hey, how are you doing? And, and really not intending to get into a long conversation. But for someone to really take the time, okay, now we got over the formality, how are you doing? Someone will say, okay, now tell me, how are you really doing? And then we can have a conversation about how I'm really doing. And when the tables are turned and I'm able to do that for someone else, the kinds of the depths of conversation that we have together uh, is a real gift. Thank you folks for your reflections on loss. Thank you for being with us on day one.